the background to this session, which is a very important session, is the tragedy which happened in Japan. Not just the earthquake and the tsunami, but in particular, the Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster. And against that background, we really are forced to ask the question, what price do we have to pay as a world for energy security? And we have four people who I'd like to invite to come in uh, on our panel. Uh, the first, gentlemen, do come in and take your seats. The first is Justin Dargin. It's great to meet you, Justin. Pleasure. Justin is from the US, and he is an energy research fellow with the Dubai Initiative at the Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard. He has a background uh, in the private sector. He's also worked for OPEC, and he's published widely on this subject. Secondly, uh, and as we welcome him, Professor Haidichi Okada, uh, we'd like to say to you, we'd like to extend to you our deepest sympathy for what your country has gone through, and in particular, for the extraordinary dignity which the Japanese people have shown in the way they handled it. And I think we should give him an applause. Professor Ricardo spent his life in public service in various ministries in Tokyo, and at present he's the Vice Minister for International Affairs at the Ministry of Economics, Trade and Industry. He's also a professor at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies. Thirdly, there is Dr. Alexander Wakaun. I hope I pronounced your surname correctly because I can honestly say I've never seen that name before. But uh, it's great to have you with us. He is the head of the General Energy Department uh, of the Paul Scherer Institute uh, in, in Switzerland. And in addition, he teaches uh, chemistry, or in, he teaches physical chemistry, I think, the chemistry department at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. He's got wide experience as an academic in this field after having worked for IBM and Bell Labs in America. And again, he has written extensively. And then finally, we have someone who I've had the honor of introducing before, uh, which is Moritz, like St. Moritz, Leuenberger. Uh, he has spent all his life in politics in Switzerland with a very distinguished career. For 15 years, he was, 15 years solidly, he was the Minister for Energy and the Environment. And in that time, in visiting neighboring countries and in people visiting Switzerland, who are other ministers of uh, energy and the environment, he says he met no less than 105 of them, which is really quite a record. In addition to that, he was twice president uh, of the Swiss Confederation. And he says now that he's retired from politics, he's free to speak. So I'd like to say that we should maybe speak in the order in which I introduced you, uh, if that's OK. And uh, after they've spoken, we'll have Q&A. Thank you very much. OK, well, hello. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here uh, back in St. Gillian. I was here in 2008, a uh, wonderful experience. And even though I must say that uh, 
my experience then was quite high, but uh, it was unimaginable. But this year actually exceeded my, uh, my already high expectations. So it's quite a pleasure to be here. Now, what I'm going to do is when I um, discuss this topic of uh, energy security, and of course, the title is Energy Security, The Price We Have to Pay, I'm going to break it down into its two constituent parts. So first, I'm going to speak about energy security. And then I'm going to speak about the price that we have to pay and discuss the myriad implications of even what that phrase means. Now, energy security... That's all within 10 minutes. All within 10 minutes, perhaps even 8 minutes, 30 That's seconds. That's great. That's great. <laughs> but uh, within energy security, basically, in- energy security is a very amorphous term. Uh, it's, 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 it means different things for different actors. So this actually reminds me of uh, the U.S. Supreme Court's a struggle to develop a workable definition for obscenity in the 1970s. And basically what it boiled down to is when one of the justices said, obscenity is, I know it when I see it. And that's almost like what energy security is. So if we look at the U.S. perspective, uh, the U.S. being, of course, one of the, the major energy importers in the world, the U.S. tends to view energy security as being predicated upon uh, increasing domestic energy production, primarily oil, Uh, because it views uh, dependence on foreign sources of oil from ostensibly uh, unstable uh, areas in the world as being injurious to national security. And then added to that, we have this drive towards renewable energy. Now, of course, uh, renewable energy production is a bit uh, related to um, the fight against climate change. And a weird thing has occurred, though, with the drive towards uh, increasing our production of renewable energy. And that has been that two opposite sides of the political spectrum, the left and the right, have actually found one thing to agree upon. So if you look at the left, which is um, composed of, let's say, environmentalists and so on, they, of course, want to increase our production of renewable energy to, for ecological reasons and also to reduce uh, carbon emissions. And then also you have the right, which is composed of um, national security hawks, is what we call it. And uh, these individuals, they believe that uh, being dependent on foreign sources of oil uh, will impact uh, the United States' uh, national security. So these two groups have come together. They actually agree upon this one point. Now, to move on to the EU, energy security in the EU is mostly comprised of this fear, uh, somewhat justified, of Russia and Russia's exports of natural gas to the EU. And particularly the EU, EU policymakers, they were afraid or they, when they saw the, the disruptions, the su- supply disruptions from uh, 2005, uh, 2007, and 2008, uh, this really sharpened their minds uh, for uh, the potential danger that uh, dependence on a major supplier poses. So in the EU, they attempted to diversify. And that's the mantra of the EU today, diversification, diversification, diversification. And they're looking to perhaps import uh, LNG from the Middle East, from the Gulf, Uh, They're looking uh, for perhaps um, solar energy production with um, the major project called Desert Tech, although it hasn't necessarily picked up steam yet. But they've really been looking to branch out. So it hasn't been like in the U.S., for instance, where there's this push for domestic energy production, but it's more about diversification. Now, if we move farther east to China, China is nearly obsessed about energy security. Because China needs to move millions, perhaps even hundreds of millions of people into the labor market. So it's dependent on extremely high economic growth. And it has to sustain this growth uh, perhaps for for several decades even. So if anything impacts that economic growth, then you can have uh, social chaos. And China, of course, is uh, no stranger to peasant uprisings and so on throughout its extremely long history. So what China is attempting to do, it's attempting to actually move back in time in the way they have used energy. And by moving back in time, the oil, it, the oil sector uh, during the mid uh, 20th century was actually not dependent on uh, market forces. It was not really supply and demand. It actually was quite highly regulated or administered by the major oil companies. So during that time, there were a series of bilateral contracts or bilateral, uh, let's say, sales contracts, export contracts between importing nations, exporting companies, or what have you. But That gradually relaxed uh, during the 1970s, 1980s, and the oil market became much more dependent upon market forces. So what China is doing, China is actually stepping back, going to the far-flung corners of the earth, Africa, Latin America, and so on, and seeking to secure 
its energy supply through a series of bilateral contracts. Okay, and the way that it is um, encouraging these contracts is that, or sweetening the deal, so to speak, is that it will grant infrastructure uh, deals or low-cost, uh, low-interest loans or what have you without any type of additional conditionalities, which is uh, nearly uh, a bad word for me in developing countries, particularly within Africa. Uh, and, uh, and what it would do is it will really push these, and then it will seek to supply its uh, industrial engine uh, with the extremely long-term contracted for source of energy. Now, if we look at Japan, Japan is nearly the same way, concerned, extremely concerned about its sources of energy. And uh, Japan, of course, being an island na nation with no indigenous energy production to speak of, uh, is more dependent on market forces. So it's not necessarily like China where it seeks to go out and develop bilateral contracts with, uh, with developing nations. But what it does is it relies upon the market. And then also Japan is well known to pay uh, top dollar, top euro, what, top yen, what have you, uh, for uh, its uh, energy imports. But Japan has had, uh, Japan's, the Japanese view in terms of uh, energy security is a bit justified. And it goes back actually to the first oil embargo. Now, the first oil embargo is actually not 1973. The first oil embargo occurred during World War II. So this first oil embargo, which was actually launched by the United States, uh, sharpened minds uh, within uh, Japan and also other nations as to uh, the threat that being embargoed uh, could pose for industrialization, economic growth, and what have you. Now, a view which has been a bit neglected, and I think it's extremely important, is the view of the exporting nations themselves. And we often don't hear this during the contemporary discourse of energy security and what have you. But when you look at the view of energy exporting countries, major energy exporting countries, they are just as concerned with energy security. And oftentimes there tends to be this smear image effect. When these countries hear about energy security or calls for energy security or rhetoric or what have you emanating from the Western countries, they become quite afraid. Because what they hear in energy security is that our revenue is going to decline precipitously in the future. Now, if we look at this within the current context of the, the so-called Arab Spring, we can see that this has the uh, added importance for many of the oil exporting countries. So for them, this is actually a veiled threat when, they talk, when there are calls for, let's say, reduction of carbon and, and energy independence and so on. So their view of energy security is actually security of demand, not security of supply, such as we have uh, in the Western countries typically. So security of demand is that uh, these countries want to diversify their, ex uh, uh, their export centers or, or places to which they export, countries to which they export. So they no longer want to be, they no longer want to be reliant upon uh, the Western world uh, for, uh, for demand. And actually, since 2008, we can see that this isn't necessarily uh, something that you can depend upon. So they are moving out towards Atlantic uh, to the Pacific Basin, to China, South Korea, uh, also historically Japan as well, and these emerging markets in, in East Asia to have security of demand. So this is extremely important. Now, what I'd like to do, I'd like to uh, develop this theme a bit more and discuss the concluding aspect of the title, which is the price we must pay. Now, the price we must pay, this is not necessarily the price that we have to pay at the gas pump, although many of us are perhaps complaining about this on a daily basis. No, this is the price that we must pay as a society, as a global community. Now, the price that we must pay is, uh, during my research, uh, I have looked at how the energy policies of a certain industrial nation, industrialized nations, and also certain emerging markets have impacted the developing world in perhaps certain unforeseen ways. So what I'd like us to do, I'd like us to consider the impact of uh, the biofuel policies of uh, many of the industrialized countries. And of course, there is a noble aim behind many of these policies. Uh, it's to reduce carbon and uh, carbon emissions and so on. Uh, but at the same time, this has had repercussions within the developing world. Now, what I'd like us to look at is actually the increase in the price of basic foodstuffs that have occurred in the, develop in the developing world over the past decade due to uh, these biofuel policies. And there has been a tremendous impact, actually. So I'm not saying that there's causation, that because of the biofuel policies of the industrialized states, that there has been a direct, uh, direct impact, or, or this has actually caused the social political instability uh, that we're experiencing now, not only in the Arab world, this is actually spread throughout Africa, and it's not really 
uh, discussed that much uh, in, the, in the global press, but I mean, this has afflicted uh, 20, 30 countries perhaps. So what has happened over the past decade as these ambitious biofuel targets have been set, what it has done, it has caused an upward pressure on the price of basic foodstuffs. And actually the UN uh, Food and Agriculture Organization just stated that for last year, for its 20 year history, the price of basic foodstuffs is at its highest level with the potential to throw 44 million people in developing countries into destitution, into extreme poverty. Now, of course, when there's extreme poverty, we all know this is a truism, that there's going to be social political instability. And we only have to look back into history. If we look back, uh, for instance, uh, in the context of the Arab Spring, we've seen people, of course, go back 20 years in the past to 1989. Some people have gone back to perhaps 1848. And the farthest that I've heard is actually 1789. But you can even go back farther in history. But just to add some context to this, in 17, from 1788 to 1789, there had been an 88% increase in the price of bread in France. And what this did, it pushed many of the French peasants into extreme destitution. And these were the very people that were out in the streets calling for uh, the heads of the aristocracy. Now, of course, there are underlying political grievances, of course, but the rise in the basic price of foodstuffs exacerbated these underlying grievances. So if we look at countries today where the political situation is, of course, perhaps not up to the norms of uh, the Western world, perhaps, um, but if there is a high level of economic development, for, in most cases, the calls for political um, enfranch enfranchisement have actually been muted. But it's, with, it's with within areas where there has been perhaps a lack of democratization and also a lack of economic growth that has really caused extreme social political instability. So what I'd like us to just think about is that when we are considering economic or, or energy security, energy security within the global context, we must make certain that this energy security does not lead to social political insecurity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, sorry, uh, apologies for the uh, misunderstanding. I had been handed the mic earlier, but never mind. Um, Marcos Pelliner, my question is for the panel, and I, I agree completely that energy efficiency and reduction of consumption is a, a real way forward, but I'd like to hear comments about the energy efficiency gap and you know, how we can overcome that. The idea that when we deploy technologies, often they're not used to their full potential, and that could be because of really difficult social or cultural reasons. And so it's been estimated that that gap accounts for about 30% of potential loss. And so what, what do you see as the best way forward to actually engage households in how they use energy and, and minimize that gap? Thank you. I wonder if we can have, we really are running over time, but Justin, E each of you, a quick comment on this. First, Justin. Oh, sure. I mean, I, I can make a quick comment. And actually, uh, there have been two periods uh, in recent history whereby energy consumption has dropped precipitously. One was the collapse of the Soviet Union, and then you saw within uh, what is now the CIS, uh, energy consumption was nearly halved. Uh, and then also uh, the global financial uh, crisis. Uh, energy consumption, carbon uh, emissions drop precipitously. I mean, so you can see this organic link uh, between uh, economic growth, as I indicated earlier, and also uh, consumption. But I think that essentially it requires a uh, dual-pronged strategy if you want to increase energy efficiency. You have to have, on the supply side, uh, you have to have uh, a type of understanding of the benefits that can be derived by instituting uh, certain uh, advanced technology and so on. And then also there has to be demand side, uh, so within the household. So uh, you have to perhaps give s tax breaks or you have to uh, develop some type of a framework uh, whereby the average household uh, would uh, thereby um, uh, feel that it's beneficial, beneficial to institute that. So I think you have to have this approach. And in 2005, the U.S. Um, uh, promulgated uh, the, the Energy Policy Act. The Energy Policy Act actually gave tax breaks uh, for uh, households that would purchase uh, 
this um, certain type of um, uh, equipment. It was called uh, Energy Star, and if any equipment that you bought had Energy Star on it, then you could actually apply for a tax break. I mean, so I think that that's the type of route that you should go. Then gradually you'd start to socialize people, but I think it has to come through the pocketbook, not through necessarily any type of um, uh, aspirational uh, goals, at least in the beginning. Uh, okay. Well, uh, in, in short, I, be, I believe that the combination of the goodwill of the people uh, to be more energy efficient and also, to some extent, uh, the me uh, market mechanism is necessary uh, to make the people to be more energy efficient. Alexander. Well, one talks about smart grids. One talks about smart metering. And I go here along with Moritz Leuenberger because eventually I think you want to buy your smart home, but it then has to be automatic. We have so much possibilities with controls today that this turning off can and must happen by itself. And I think the way forward is that only those products are on the market that do these. The customer can choose the good product and it's the only one that's the standard and nothing else. And then it will happen. Thank you. Moritz Leuenberg. Drei Stichworte. Gebäudevorschriften, Bauvorschriften, dann Gerätevorschriften. Und in diesem Zusammenhang muss in den internationalen Vereinbarungen äh, gegen technische Handelshemmnisse über die Handelsfreiheit müssen Klauseln sein, dass für die Energieeffizienz nationale Vorschriften gemacht werden können. Solange das nicht der Fall ist, äh, muss wegen der, wegen der Handelsfreiheit jedes Gerät importiert werden können und ein Staat, der besonders energieeffizient sein möchte, ist gezwungen, Geräte zu importieren, die diesen Anforderungen nicht entsprechen. Und hier muss, so wie bei der Gesundheit solche Klauseln drin sind, müssen für die Energieeffizienz auch diese Klauseln äh, äh, hineinkommen. An extremely complex problem uh, and uh, we've seen the advocacy of the use of the market, of more regulation, and of winning hearts and minds. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the panel have been terrific, and I'd very much like to ask you to give them a great thank you. <laughs>